Good morning. Welcome to Growing Communities of Love by Growing Community Out of Conflict. This is Mary Cyphers for Mary Cyphers Ministry, and I'm so grateful to see all of you gathered here together and thankful that you would give us some time on this Wednesday morning so that together we can learn how to grow community out of conflict. Conflict is a common part of life. I believe conflict is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. Some conflict is so easy to navigate that you won't need any of the tools we're going to discuss today. As we talk about growing community out of conflict, however, the tools I'm gonna be talking about today are particularly helpful when conflict is at an extreme level. When it is at that risk of destroying community is when you can best use the tools that I'm about to give you. However, it's always good to have these tools, even in a mild conflict, so that it doesn't become extreme. Um, I want to say, first off, uh, thank you for joining us today. And if you look over there on the right side of your screen, you will see there's a chat room. And uh, I will be available and online throughout the webinar to answer your questions in that chat room and also to uh, answer questions after the end of the webinar. So I hope that you'll share not just your questions, but also insights you might have as you're listening and learning. I know that many of you have had great and powerful experiences with conflict. And I know some of you have had some horrible and tragic experiences with conflict. So let's share those experiences together in the chat room so that we can learn with and from one another. And uh, I will try to address as many of the questions as I can. If for some reason you're not able to access the chat room, feel free to email me during the webinar. And that address is mary at marycyphers.com. So uh, let's, before we turn to the teaching modules, I wanna let you know that my videographer, who is also my son, Michael Bew, has pre-recorded the teaching components of this event. And that's gonna be very helpful. We found it very helpful last, um, Friday when sound was not working. Uh, I see that a couple of you um, were not able to get sound. Check to make sure your mute button is not turned on. There's a mute button and you may even have sound settings, but it looks like most people are hearing fine. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn to our first teaching segment to introduce to you the concept of growing community out of conflict. Let's watch. Hi, I'm Mary Cyphers for Mary Cyphers Ministries, and I'm so honored to invite you and welcome you to today's webinar, Growing Community Out of Conflict. This is one of my favorite topics, but one of the most mysterious topics that I teach. It's come to me after many years of research, some hard learnings, some failures, and even a few successes along the way. But when we can grow communities out of conflict, we can create miracles. Growing community out of conflict is just one of many of my training tools that are part of my Growing Communities of Love program. This fall, I'll be introducing that program as part of a live three-day event, October 23, 24, and 25 at the Embassy Suites near Disneyland in Anaheim, California. I so hope you'll join me for that event. But for today, I'm really, really excited to unveil for you the three steps to creating a community, even out of conflict. So let's get started. Many years ago, I was sent to a church in deep conflict. I was sent there specifically to help determine whether the church could rise out of conflict and create a true church community. They were deeply divided. They were in a lot of grief and pain. And yet somehow, in the year that I spent with them, I watched them miraculously create community out of the ashes of the conflict that had almost destroyed that church. I became passionate about creating community, creating community of love, no matter where I went. But fast forward to two churches later, and I find myself causing the conflict, creating more conflict instead of community. This was something I didn't want to do, and yet one day I found myself in a shouting match with the chair of the Board of Trustees right in the middle of the church council meeting. Talk about embarrassing. I could see that I was hurting people. I could see that he was hurting people. 
People did not find community out of us yelling at each other. And I wanted to learn more. And so over the years, I have studied, I have learned, and I have grown. And I've watched others do this brilliantly, creating community out of conflict, learning how to communicate with love, even in times of division. And so I've developed my own three-step method, watching some of these amazing people and learning from them so that with this three-step method, anybody can begin creating community out of conflict. Ha! Huh. You know what? I had no sound because I had the mute button turned off. Just what I told you not to do. There we go. I think we have sound again. Sorry about that. What I was saying is that many people experience conflict as negative because they've had that type of conflict you just talked about in the poll. Conflict that destroys relationships. When we've had those kind of extreme conflict experiences, then we discover that conflict is negative. But if you look back over the lifetime of conflict, you might rediscover that conflict is actually neutral. Think about it. Think about a time when a child falls down when they're learning to walk. That's a conflict, a conflict between gravity and the child. But every time the child picks him or herself up and starts walking again, they get closer to becoming a walker, competent at walking. Similarly, every time we pick ourselves up from conflict, we become competent as conflict engagers. And that's what this program is all about. So without further ado, I'm gonna to turn to our second video as we introduced the first of three steps that I wanna to bring to you to help you engage in conflict in a positive way, even when conflict is at its most extreme. Let's watch. So how do you do this? Well, I call it the stop, drop, and roll method. Yes, most people think of that as a way to escape a fire. But honestly, when you're in the middle of a de deeply divisive conflict, it can feel like you're in a firefight. That's part of the problem with a deeply divisive conflict. We start thinking we are actually in danger. The chemicals in our brain start sending us messages as if there was a lion or a tiger or even a bear out to get us. When we're in the middle of a really heated argument or there's conflict swirling around us, it is easy to forget there actually isn't a lion in the room. Those people that we're arguing with are not tigers. They're not even bears. But our brain can't process this unless we first stop. That's the first step. Stop the conflict. Stop long enough to calm down. When we can stop the conflict, then our brain gets to re-engage its higher self. If we don't, we run the risk of becoming like our Neanderthal sisters and brothers from many, many eons ago, who went, who went extinct, you might remember, because they couldn't engage their higher brain functions. If we only stay in that fight or flight mode and start thinking the person we're arguing with is actually out to get us, we start wanting to fight or fly. That fight or flight mentality doesn't help in conflict. It doesn't help create community. It simply frightens us and ends up frightening the people who are around us if we're engaging in the conflict destructively rather than constructively. So stop the madness, stop the conflict. When you realize the conflict has become so divisive, so extreme that damage is being done, ask everyone to take a time out. I think of many, many years ago when my son was three. He never went through the terrible twos. He was a perfect two-year-old. But then when three hit, I suddenly knew what the parents of the terrible twos were talking about. He was finding his own voice, his own opinions, and his opinions were strong ones, and they did not always agree with mine. We often found ourselves arguing, and usually to no good result. But the one incident that I particularly remember was over whether or not he would brush his teeth. It was that bewitching hour of 7 p.m. when he was tired, I was tired, I just wanted him to go to bed, he just wanted to read some stories and play with his toys, but I was insisting he brush his teeth. He'd just finished his dinner, he'd had a little dessert, it's the natural thing, a mama wants her little boy to brush his teeth. And so into the bathroom we went. 
His least favorite place was with that toothbrush and toothpaste. Now I tried every toothpaste possible. I had bought him his favorite flavor. It was pretty colored. It had sparkles. I thought surely this sparkly toothpaste on top of the sparkly toothbrush would yield good results. But no, he had set his jaw. He was not going to touch that toothbrush and it was certainly not going to enter his mouth. Now, I don't know when in this conflict I forgot that I was the adult and he was the child, but somewhere along the line, I clearly forgot and my pulse started racing. My heartbeat was pounding. My breath was growing short. My temper was growing even shorter. My eyes were bulging. My face was red. I'm yelling at him, Michael, brush your teeth. He's yelling back, Mom, I won't. Michael, brush your teeth. I kept getting louder and louder. Guess what he did? He kept getting louder and louder. At one point, I was so angry. I took my hand, I slammed it on the bathroom counter. It was a hard bathroom counter. I said, Michael, brush your teeth. He in turn took his little hand, slammed it on that same counter and said, Mommy, I won't. And then we both saw each other in the mirror. We looked ridiculous. We were both by then red faced, sweaty, eyes bulging, so angry. We didn't even look like ourselves. And we both just burst out laughing. We stopped the conflict with the gift of laughter. To this day, I have no idea if he brushed his teeth that night. He doesn't even remember the incident because we stopped the conflict. That slamming of our hands, oh boy, did we feel that. It hurt so badly and we saw how ridiculous we were. It was like it knocked sense back into us. In stopping the conflict, we were able to continue a good mother-son relationship laughing together. What I do know is at some point that night we read some stories and he went to bed and he slept peacefully as did I because we stopped the conflict before we became even more of our Neanderthal selves. He was acting like a typical tired three-year-old but somewhere in the middle of the conflict I began acting like a typical tired three-year-old and I was a 33-year-old. What was I thinking? I wasn't because the conflict had caused all of my brain chemicals to confuse me and I was no longer acting out of my mature, loving, motherly self. I was just acting as if it was a fight to the death. I had to win. This is what happens if we let conflict go on and on and on. But if we can stop it, if we can say, everyone be quiet, things can start to change. In this stop stage, we have a chance to calm down. It's a good time to take deep cleansing breaths. Just think about it. Just taking a deep breath right now. Doesn't it make you feel different? You hear my words differently. You think about your own experiences of conflict differently. In the midst of an extreme conflict, to stop the conflict, and take a deep breath can change everything. Your pulse will begin to slow. The energy of the room will change. Your heart rate will even out. In this stop stage, it's an opportunity to pray, not with words, but with silence. Taking those deep breaths in, we can invite Holy Spirit to breathe with us, to give us that peace that passes all understanding. I think that's how Quakers achieve their ability to be peacemakers. They're churchgoers like so many others. I'm sure they have all the same church conflicts that every church has. But their tradition is so different. The preacher doesn't preach. People listen. One of the most powerful experiences I've ever had was attending a Quaker wedding, where after the vows, we sat silently, blessing the couple, praying for the couple. This was a celebration of love, and even in the celebration of love, they took a deep, intimate time of silence. And then as people were led, they stood and offered a word of blessing, or peace, or hope, a prayer for the young couple. When I experienced this Quaker worship experience, this service of prayer, silence, in blessing to this couple, 
I experienced a peace as nothing I've ever encountered at any other wedding before or after. In this stop stage, this is a time to pray silently. This is not a time to lecture. This is not a time to say, you go on a timeout, but I don't need one. In conflict, everyone in the room needs the timeout. Even just the people who are observing the conflict need time to breathe. Because even if you're just observing the conflict, you are a part of the conflict. Your heart begins racing. Your fears begin rising. And everything is seen in a very gray and different light. We want to brighten the light by calming down. I call this the red light phase. It's like a reverse stoplight. We have to stop the conflict before we can go anywhere productive. So stop. Calm down. Invite everyone to calm down with silence. The stop the conflict stage can take as long as five days or as short as five minutes, but it almost always needs at least five minutes. This is a good time to say, I think we all need a bathroom break, or let's all go get a cup of coffee, but I invite you to do it silently. Otherwise, we all run the risk of continuing the conflict as we leave the room, and we don't give our brains, our hearts, our souls a chance to readjust and truly accept the calming presence of our new thoughts, of God who's been trying to enter in, but in the midst of the conflict, we're usually shutting the doors on anything God could be saying. So stop. Let that red light calm you down because the red light is telling you this is no time to get into the intersection. This is a time to reflect. And how do you know when to re-engage? Look inward. Observe your own emotions. See if you're ready. I have a friend who runs a, a praise team, and he says that when conflict arises at rehearsal on a Thursday night, he always sends everyone home. He said, it's late at night, we're tired, there's no way we're gonna resolve this at nine at night. Let's all go home and sleep on it. Even if it means an extra rehearsal later in the week, he always sends the team home to calm down when conflict arises. And guess what? In his praise team, conflict doesn't arise that often because in the times when they have halted the conflict and gone home and slept on it, they've learned how to begin managing their conflict by creating community that says, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter as much as I thought it did. This is the calming effect of the stop the conflict stage. Red light, Think of that child's game the next time conflict arises. If you want, make it a code word in all of your church meetings, in all of your staff meetings, even in your family meetings. Any person could call out, red light, and it just means stop. I need to calm down. Even if no one else needs to calm down, if I cry red light, it says to everyone, I need to calm down before I can engage constructively. Welcome back. I'm wondering how many of you have ever experienced that calming effect. So thank you for answering the poll. It gives me hope to realize that we have experienced those moments when calming down really helps in the midst of conflict. It's a great gift to calm our minds, to calm our hearts, to calm our souls. It calms our bodies and calming our bodies. We are physical beings and it impacts our emotions and our spiritual well-being whenever we can calm down, even in the midst of conflict. I love this red light stage. Sometimes people hate it because there's so much of that anger and so much of that, well, like the woman in the video holding her hair. But I don't know, when I looked at that baby screaming, I laughed because I remembered we can make it better. My son and I made it better. You can always make conflict better and start becoming more productive. If conflict is an ongoing issue in your church community, your business life, your family, or if just the desire to grow a healthier and stronger community is a great passion for you, then you're definitely going to want to be part of my fall event when I'll be going even more deeply into this stop, drop, and roll method. 
we're going to be going to the drop video here in just a moment. But for now, I want to just uh, invite you to the fall event, which is going to be a wonderful experience for so many of us. And that's going to be October 23. 24 and 25 at the uh, Disneyland Embassy Suites here in Anaheim, California. And I wanted to let you all know about that upcoming event because on today's webinar, not only if you can you get the early bird price, the super early bird price for $149 for a three day event training, not just in this stop, drop and roll method, but many other gifts like how to listen deeply, how to lead with love, how to create a church that's growing, a family that's growing, a business that's growing because of the power of love, not because of our specific worship services or our cool tools or our cool business plan, but because we are a uniquely healthy community of love. I think you can turn on the news any night and recognize that healthy communities of love are a rarity in our world today. And yet where they exist, Growth is occurring, spirit is moving, God is able to move and work through people when we are working in healthy relationships, when we're really living that great commandment to love God, to love ourselves and love our neighbors as ourselves. It shouldn't be a rarity, it should be the norm in a church family. And I have found that when it is the norm in a church family, church families grow and they expand, not just numerically, but more important, they grow in their impact in the world. They grow in the way they're helping others and in the way that they're growing in their love of God, in their spiritual relationship with God and one another. So I'm looking forward to delve deeply into this whole topic, not just stop, drop and roll, but the wholeness of creating communities of love this October. And like I say, if you sign up today, you not only get just the early bird price, you'll get the free VIP package add-on, which includes front row seating, a couple special books from me, some free coaching from my husband, BJ Bu, who's on my staff as our uh, executive coach and spiritual director. And in addition, you will get some pre-conference coaching specifically in an area of conflict or building community of love that you want to work on this summer. So if you sign up today, you're already going to get two free coaching sessions this summer. You don't have to wait for the October event to get going on things. So uh, that's enough about the offer now. It's there, there on your sidebar right by the uh, chat room. For now, I want us to take a deep breath. Those of you who worship with me on Sunday mornings know this is how I start worship. Deep breath. We're back, we've said red light. We're ready to go to yellow light. Let's learn how to do that together. The experience of peace that can come over a community that has stopped the conflict and rested in silent prayer can transform everything. And when that transformation occurs, you're ready to go to the drop stage. Drop into spirit. This is a yellow stage. It's like a yellow light, not a fast paced red light, green light game like from childhood, but a red light to a yellow light before you're ready to go to the green light. In this yellow light stage, you're aware of your own emotions. You're aware of the emotions of the room. You're aware as you begin speaking to one another that you need to speak gently. You need to speak calmly. This is a time to continue listening, listening deeply to one another, listening deeply to God. Drop into spirit, look upward for God's guidance and discover in this cautious stage that you can start engaging in conversation with compassion and love, and there is nothing that builds community more strongly than compassion and love. I have a friend who to this day says, I'm still not sure if I believe in God, but he has had one very palpable experience of God, and it was during a conflicted church meeting. He could feel his heart racing. He could feel his breath shortening. 
He was very angry with the man who was speaking at the church council meeting. He told me later that he was sure he was going to embarrass his wife. He was an entrepreneur who ran his own company. He was used to losing his temper with his employees because he was the boss. He could. They had to obey. But he was under strict orders from his wife. You must control your temper at church. And so he was trying to control his temper. He was trying to stop the conflict, but his heart was racing. He was not sure he could. He was like, I think I need help. I think I need help. I think I need help. And the next thing he knew, he felt a hand on his shoulder, holding him in his seat. He thought, oh, my wife is here. She can tell that I'm about ready to lose my temper and yell at this guy. He looked around for his wife and she wasn't in the room. There was no physical being putting a hand on his shoulder, but he knew he had felt that hand. When he asked for help, he dropped into spirit and God was there. When he looked around, he was looking up for the guidance he most needed and he got it. The guidance that said, calm down, I got this. And he said that someone else calmly responded to the person. Everyone moved off of the topic and the person's terrible idea and things went on as they should. All because my friend dropped into spirit and allowed God's hand to slow him, to cause him to be cautious. Later in the meeting, he was able to talk about the topic calmly, cogently, consistently, and community continued to be created in that vicious church council meeting that could have gone a very different direction if he had lost his temper. When we drop into spirit, when we delay responding in this yellow stage, we allow our souls to connect with God's spirit. We allow our higher power to really change the tenor of the conversation. This is a powerful stage. Magic can happen because the mystery of God's Holy Spirit is now engaging in the entire community. Every moment that we give God to engage with us is another moment when we can engage at a higher level. Give people the time they need. Give as much time as you possibly can. I have a friend who runs a praise band and whenever he finds his team in conflict late at night, he just disbands the rehearsal. He says, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Even if it means another rehearsal later in the week, they have all learned it's better to go cautiously into the conflict than to engage in a conflict when they're tired and angry. Caution has built a band that almost never has conflict now because they take that dropping into the spirit so seriously that they disband. They go home and sleep and they pray and then the next day they talk. That's a pretty extreme yellow stage, but if that's what you need to do, especially if it's a late night meeting and the conflicts are hard or it's late afternoon and everybody's hungry and wants to go home, let the yellow stage take people home. Invite people to pray. Invite people to reflect on what they've experienced. Invite people to meditate, to think about what they've heard, to learn from what they've heard. This yellow stage allows our brain all of the right chemicals. We have enough oxygen flowing to think more clearly. It's amazing the memory that we can engage in this yellow stage. We start remembering the conflicted conversation differently. We can hear anew the arguments others were making. We can even see the logic in their arguments. We can see the reason, the compassion, the love, the passion, and the purpose, even in opinions that are completely different than our own. Because now we're acting at a higher level. We're back at that level that is a level of love, a level of engagement with spirit, a level of engagement with one another. This is not the time to start the conversation yet. It's a good time to ask curious questions. What did you feel whenever we were arguing? Why do you think we got so lost? What did you think when John said such and such? Did you hear Jane say this? I'm just realizing I had never heard that argument before. I want to think more about that. 
asking curious questions, engaging reflectively. This is a really powerful time to just start conversation cautiously, cautiously approaching so that we don't turn back to being afraid and thinking it's a lion or a tiger or a bear, but we see that the person in front of us is indeed a person, a child of God, fully engaged with us so that we can feel that hand on our shoulder if we start to fight again or we want to fly. This is a chance to truly let God guide the conversation, letting ourselves slow down enough that God can get control. This is not the time for persuasion. This is not the time for debate. This is not time to get a zinger in. That just puts us right back to the red light stage. This is a time to let the Holy Spirit really enter in and change your movement forward. I hope that you've had a chance in your lifetime to experience that breath, that, that yellow light stage. But if you haven't, start using that tool that you don't just stop the conflict, but that you then move to a cautious stage before re-engaging. I find particularly in one-on-one -on -one arguments, we often skip this stage. I think we naturally know, oh, we need to stop arguing, but then we try to re-engage and go to what I'm gonna to explain to you in a few minutes is the green light stage before we've had this in-between time. It's why I like to remember the reverse stoplight because it's a physical and visible reminder to me we need the in-between time. Yeah, maybe my heart rate has calmed down, but my brain needs to catch up. My emotions need to catch up. Sometimes the whole room needs to catch up, particularly in group conflict. We are helped when we remember that every person in the room is going to need a different pace before they're able to re-engage with one another. And that's where different ways of resolving conflict can be very helpful. I'm going to put a poll up just to ask you if you have a favorite way to resolve conflict. If I'd been able to put a seventh answer, I'd have put other. But it'd be interesting to hear if one of these is one of your favorite ways. Or you might have another one. If you have a different one and another one, put it in the chat room. Um, somebody said they can barely hear me, so I'm going to turn my volume up and let me know if that's a little better, Denise. I find that after the yellow light stage, I'm a different person. The room is a different place. And in that different place, miracles can happen. But for the miracle to happen, we need this third step. So let's turn to our next video as we learn together how to go into the roll stage, the green light stage, as we roll forward together to engage constructively after a time of conflict. After you feel like enough time has passed, again, it might be as long as five minutes, it might be as long as five days, depending on the level of conflict. But after you feel that enough time has passed, enough prayer has happened, enough conversation that is non-controversial has begun to happen, then you're ready to roll, to roll forward together. This is the green light stage, but this is not a gun your engines green light stage. This is a cautious green light stage. It's like being at a busy intersection. In my little beach town, our intersections are all very busy in the summer. We live on the coast and Coast Highway is one of the busiest highways in Southern California but it is still a small town. We kind of all know each other. And I will never forget the time when I was at the green light, first to go, I was in the furthest right lane. Now I could see the light had turned green, but the oncoming traffic was not coming into the intersection. There were two lanes to my left and they weren't moving. They weren't moving and I didn't know why. One was a large panel truck next to me. I couldn't see anything around the panel truck but my instinct was I should be rolling forward very slowly because no one else is going into the intersection. I listened, there were no police lights. I looked, the light was green. And then in front of that panel truck, one of my family's dearest friends 
was walking across the intersection on her red light. Now I knew Anne, and I knew she couldn't see worth a darn, but there she was walking with her little dog, slow as molasses, when it was supposed to be our green and her red. But we all sat there patiently until she got safely to the curb, and then we all slowly rolled into the intersection. I'm pretty sure only two or three cars got through that green light, but thank heavens, if any one of us had proceeded too quickly, she wouldn't have made it, and all of us would have been stopped for hours, and her life would never have been the same, let alone that of her sweet little dog. I'm so glad we rolled forward together. And that's what this stage is. It's a rolling stage. You've stopped the conflict. You've dropped into spirit, and now you're ready to roll forward together to go forward in a way that is engaging constructively, that is continuing to listen deeply, to ask curious questions, to remember the other opinions that you've heard, and to try to integrate and engage them. This is a chance to go ahead and get back into that conflicted situation, that conflicted conversation, or with that person that seems to cause you so much conflict. As long as you're rolling, not going with great guns, but just rolling calmly and lovingly. Then you can roll forward together. This is a chance to listen. Listening is the key to this stage. Not talking, although you will be talking because that's part of engaging constructively. But listen first. Seek to understand before you start seeking to talk and be understood. As you listen, you can open yourself to new perspectives. You'll listen and hear new ideas. Think about the opportunities that going forward together can give you that would be very different than going forward alone. This is an opportunity to strive for empathy. Empathy can transform any conflict. It's a great time to also continue using your I statements. I heard that you're really angry about the new fee structure, but I was just wanting to help the church get more revenue. That's an I statement on both counts, even as you make your argument. I know that the, the name plaque on the wall matters a lot to you because John Doe was a favorite beloved member of this church. I really heard your great love for him and your respect and your desire to have that plaque on the wall out of love for him. Before you start arguing about why you don't want the plaque on the wall, let them know you've heard why they do. What is the love? What is the fear? What is the hope? What are the emotions behind their arguments? The more that you can hear and understand those and show them in your conversation in this green light stage, the more that you're setting the stage for you to roll forward together in the same direction. Rolling forward together in the same direction unleashes amazing miracles with God's help. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, where two or three are gathered, I am in their midst. When he also says, I will send you a helper, the advocate. This is that opportunity in the green light stage for us to engage with one another and to engage with God at a deeper level. This is a great time to extend your prayer time. It's a great time to pray together with words. It's a great time to pray together and then listen again silently, not because you need a time out, but because you are truly ready to hear whatever new revelation God is ready to reveal. This is also an opportunity to express your own emotions, letting others begin to feel empathy for you and talking about the purpose and the passion that is driving your opinion. You, again, using I statements transforms the conversation. The green light stage can be one of the most energizing and exciting times in conflict because this is where community is born anew. Now, does it happen every time? Does it happen miraculously? Well, it always happens miraculously, but it doesn't happen every time. This can be a loop. If in the green light stage you find yourself heart racing, voices rising, anger escalating, 
it's okay to say, we've got to go back to the red light stage and start over. It's okay to loop it because each time we loop back through, we learn a little bit more about each other and we de-escalate the conflict every single time. And we learn a new pattern of behavior that can change everything. I love the green light stage, but I know that it's a challenging stage because it's so tempting to get back into old patterns. It's tempting to think, I'm going to jump that green light. I got to be through the intersection first. I'm in a hurry. I want my way. But the minute we do that, we're moving back to our Neanderthal selves, our fight or flight selves. I got to fly through this intersection. I got to fight to right. That's not us at our best. And it's not how we can create community out of conflict. But when we are listening well, when we're striving for empathy, when we're expressing our own emotional connection to our opinions and allowing others to empathize with us, we are creating community. Whatever the decision about the conflict, whether you get your way or you don't, or even better yet, you find a third way you hadn't yet thought of. Just the listening, the speaking our emotions, and the developing empathy with and for one another creates community. This is where community arises out of conflict. Read the book of Acts. In that book, the best community stories happen when they engage in conflict constructively. There are plenty of times in that book when they don't and they go their separate ways. But when they engage in the conversation, miracles happen. The Spirit adds numbers to their flock and new opportunities are given to them. This is a wonderful time to transform your church, your family, your business, your community because you've engaged in conflict constructively. You can start rolling forward together. Using this stop, drop, and roll, this reverse stoplight pattern of red, then yellow, then green, can transform any conflicted situation. The most trivial and the most extreme. But in extreme situations, it can be so transformative. It really can begin to create a healthy community of love arising from the ashes of conflict. This is an opportunity for us to show the world that it's possible to have different opinions and still create community. It's possible even to engage in destructive conflict and transform that destruction into construction, the construction of a community. This stop, drop, and roll method is just one of many, many techniques that are part of my growing communities of love. I hope that you'll be joining me this fall as we join together at the Embassy Suites at Disneyland for our first conference on growing communities of love, where I will talk not just about this method, but many other techniques and tools to help you grow your church, grow your business, and grow your family in a way that enhances and expands love, not just in your community, but in all the world. I hope you'll join me and I look forward to learning more with you in the days to come. Hello again, my friends. And uh, I just wanted to remind you that the offer is going to be online and available for another 30 minutes. And then this special offer with the additional coaching sessions that happen before the event even will end at, at the uh, one hour and 15 minute mark after this event is over. This concludes the teaching portion of uh, today's webinar, Growing Community Out of Conflict. But I'm going to stay online for another 15 minutes uh, to answer any questions that you have. If you'll put those in the chat room, uh, if you have a specific conflict in your local church, we can talk about that. If you have a question about the stop stage or the drop stage or the roll stage, or you have a different method or an insight that has worked for you, share it. Let's share together and learn together how we can best create community even out of conflict. 
as you can imagine, probably hear from my voice, creating communities of love is a passion for me. It's been a part of my own personal purpose for as long as I've been in ministry, and I love learning new tools. So I look forward to um, hearing about tools that are working for you or experiences that you have had when you have successfully navigated conflict or when you have failed. I will tell you that I have learned as much about engaging conflict constructively because of the times when I have engaged in conflict destructively. It's embarrassing to admit, but it is the truth that I sometimes am my own worst enemy. My suspicion is all of us have had that experience of being our own worst enemy. And so uh, I, the, the times in those moments when they happen and I'm wishing they weren't happening, the only hope I can find in there is, oh, at least I can learn from this. Maybe I will learn some new skills. So uh, let me know if you have questions, just chat those in the chat room and I will uh, try to address any questions that come up. Not seeing any right now, but I know when I did this on Friday, it took a few minutes for people to start thinking about their questions. And I think that I will put up a poll just to um, see where you all are at. Let's see, let's see what's most, let's see which of the learnings was newest to you today? The stop idea, the drop, or the roll? I'm going to put that into a, a poll and see if any of those were new. Maybe none of them were, in which case, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, already knew this. I already knew this method. Okay, let's see what we have here. Um, maybe that'll get your creative juices flowing as you think about what questions you have. Um, I'll continue talking a little bit about the event while you think about what questions you have. The event is at the Embassy Suites in South Anaheim, which is the closest Embassy Suites to Disneyland. It is a Disney themed uh, hotel. And if you stay at the hotel, you'll get free full breakfast buffet every single morning that you're there. And in the evenings, there is a complimentary happy hour with appetizers for all of the hotel guests. Our event will end at five o'clock each day. On Thursday, it will actually end at two o'clock for those of you who are Southern Californians so that you have time to commute home before the rush hour gets too intense. Uh, we will begin on Tuesday morning, the 23rd at 10 a.m. And our first day will really be focusing on listening, on deep listening, on engaging and creating community right there at the event through the power of deep listening and learning some of those deep listening tools. And uh, we'll break that day at five o'clock and have a relaxing evening together. Those of you who are on the VIP package will have a special personalized uh, happy hour question and answer time with me. And then on Wednesday, we'll have a full day of learning from nine until five, where a lot of Wednesday will be really delving into this stop, drop and roll method. And Denise asks us today, how do you even begin the process of thawing out relationships that are frozen in place? What happens if people are stuck at the red light, not because they've chosen to be at the red light, but because of this, this freeze? I love your imagery, Denise. You're probably a preacher or a writer because that's a beautiful phrase. It's kind of a painfully beautiful phrase. How do you begin? the process of thawing out relationships that are frozen in place. Well, Denise, I can't say I have a magic answer, but I have several questions, even perhaps for our team, but I'm gonna ask you to think about, and everyone that's still on, to think about some of these ideas that I have. And if I have time, I'll put together a little poll here in a minute to see which of these work. One of the most powerful processes of thawing out relationships is to humble ourselves enough to apologize. I had a very painful coaching experience about um, several years ago. I was working with a client who was engaged in a congregation that was in deep conflict. This client was a key leader in the congregation and they had been a key participant in the conflict as happens with most of us when we are leading organizations in conflict. And at one point, this, she's a coaching client of mine, and she's asking, what is she going to do about this one particular leader 
who is continuing to make the conflict worse and worse and worse, but won't talk to this leader who is my coaching client because they're so angry with her. And I said to her, perhaps you could reach out and apologize for that conflict last summer that you had with them. What broke my heart was she said, I didn't do anything wrong. And I said, but could you apologize anyway? No, I didn't do anything wrong. And sometimes we contribute to the freeze if we're so insistent on being right or on winning the argument that we can't apologize. Now, I'm not asking people to apologize to, you know, in an abusive situation or a situation where they're harassed or in danger. But most of us that are in those frozen relationships know that we have contributed to the relationship's demise as well as others have contributed to the relationship's demise. And I find that an apology can slowly start the unfreeze process. The image that comes to mind for me is um, an image from, I think it's a Disney movie, it might be Pixar. No, it's Disney, Disney's Frozen. Uh, it's a story of, I can't remember her name, the Ice Queen. Anyway, if you haven't seen the movie, just go to YouTube and look for the last scene. In the last scene, the sister who has accidentally turned the entire kingdom to ice is getting ready to be killed by someone who wants to kill her because she's the ice queen. And her little sister who loves her deeply jumps in front of her to take the bullet, if you will. It's not a gun, it's a fairy tale, but her sister is then frozen. Uh, when the big sister goes in regret to hug her now frozen, allegedly dead sister, the love of that hug unfreezes her sister and her sister lives, and she learns she can unfreeze the kingdom through the power of love. Now, it's a fairy tale. I wish all conflict was this simple. But what is true about the fairy tale was that moment when the little sister, who had truly been rejected and wronged by the big sister, jumped in front to save her anyway. And then the big sister hugs her out of apology and regret. And so you have this, this visual image of the power that reconnecting in love can bring to a frozen relationship. Sometimes a hug does that, probably not if the freeze is deep because a hug is too vulnerable, too intimate. But an apology, if you can't talk to the person, I'm a big believer in handwritten notes or a kind email, but handwritten notes are magical because they're so rare in our world today. And the person doesn't have to respond back. They can read the note. They can read it again and again and think if they're ready to receive the apology. If you don't want to apologize, even just writing a note saying, I regret that our relationship seems frozen. Now, this works really well in one-on-one -on -one relationship freezes. In a group relationship, it's different because how do you unfreeze when an entire group has decided to disengage from one another or freeze each other out? That's more challenging, but I'm a big believer in honesty. Let's say the group has to gather together. Let's say it's a church council and they have to gather together once a month. But you can see when you arrive, you can hear that no one is really engaging, whether their arms are crossed with the body language or you can just see the blankness in their eyes because they're resisting, admitting, I don't really want to be here. I don't trust the people here. I'm a big believer in naming the elephant in the room and saying, I believe conflict has caused us so much pain, we're afraid to talk with each other. And then give them a topic that's not controversial. So tonight I wanna to invite us to talk about our favorite hymn. Okay, if you're arguing over music and worship, that's not the topic. But if you're arguing over whether to put out an electronic sign in the front of the church, Having a conversation about a favorite hymn and why it's your favorite hymn can help thaw the relationship. Find something common that people would enjoy talking about. If all else fails, I just ask people about what's the best thing that happened in your life this week. Take it completely out of the church or the business situation and have them start talking about, oh, I got to go watch my grandchild in their final recital. 
Oh, I got to go walk on the beach with my best friend. Oh, I had a surprise phone call from my cousin that I haven't heard from in over a year. All of a sudden they're talking about things that give them joy, that have been a, a positive experience. And they, those are safe things to talk about. So always better when there's an extreme conflict to think of it as a yellow stage. How do you cautiously re-engage in things that are not related to the conflict? If relationships are frozen, you are clearly not ready to go to the green stage. You're not ready to roll forward to engage constructively. This is a yellow stage when relationships are frozen. The freeze has caused the red light. Okay, maybe there's a gift in the freeze because people aren't arguing so um, aggressively or assertively or even openly. But the problem with the freeze stage is they're probably arguing internally. I find that in those situations, often communities are suffering from illnesses and stress and not wanting to be at church, not wanting to be at home, not wanting to be wherever the conflict is occurring until you can get it unfrozen. So it's worth engaging, but I believe in apologies, personal notes, and talking about a non-controversial conversation that people could get excited about to start re-engaging honestly and lovingly with one another around a safe topic, and pr preferably a safe topic that would bring them joy, that have them thinking happy thoughts, if you will, and I'm not trying to be naive, but it does change the energy flow if we can talk about something we love talking about, as opposed to something like, oh, I don't know, what was my favorite food? I don't know. That's not enough. You want something that really makes their heart sing. When was their favorite time with their grandchild last week? That makes people's heart sing. So that would be one suggestion I have, Denise. Um, other ideas, if anybody has an idea, put it in the chat line for Denise to give your impact and your insight. And uh, I'd welcome other questions. If you have other questions, if you have questions about the offer as well, you can put those in the chat room and you can also call me. You'll find my phone number on my website at marycyphers.com or email me again, mary at marycyphers.com if you have questions about the fall event. I guess while I'm waiting to see what questions you have, I'm gonna move on to what Thursday will be like at the fall event. Thursday is more of a half day. We'll finish our content early in the morning. Uh, we'll have a luncheon for those people who have engaged in the full year program at that point. And we'll come back together in the afternoon for an afternoon of meditative reconnecting, not just with one another, but with Holy Spirit. A chance to really be in that deep, deep breathing place of peace that passes all understanding. I find that sometimes when I go to events, if we end on a giant high, that I'm not ready to re-engage with the world because I want to stay up on the mountaintop. I want when you leave this event for you to be able to re-engage in the world in your best possible place, to become um, a leader of a healthy community of love. If you're coming to the event, don't come alone. You're gonna to wanna to bring a team. And we have a lot of special offers for teams that are coming. Uh, if you bring three, you get a fourth person free and that offer is gonna go all the way up until the day of the event because I am so passionate that you wanna bring a team to this event. One leader cannot change an entire church. I don't know, Denise, um, if you're leading a church, but I'm gonna assume that you are. And um, Let's say that Denise is the only person in her church that wants to unthaw the frozen relationship. Denise can't do it alone. She might be able to get a little tiny bit of the glacial melt, but to really unfreeze the relationship would take a team. Jesus says where two or three are gathered, I am in their midst. I think Christ is with us always, but the power of the community, everything Jesus did was with his disciples in community. He didn't even embark on his ministry until he had called those disciples. Where two or three are gathered, there is power in building a community of love. So I hope you'll bring a whole team to the event or send a team if you can't come. Really let your friends and family know that this is an event for a group of people because it takes a village to heal a village.
And it takes a village to build a community of love. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. The people who show up for this kind of a webinar already know this. So I'm trying to make as many enticements to the event, making it as affordable as possible so that it's easy for your people to say, yes, I wanna be there. We're gonna have so much fun. We're gonna go to Disneyland for the day before or after. Yes, we're gonna have discount Disneyland tickets for those of you who've never been coming from other parts of the country or just anxious for a day at Disneyland. Spend Monday or Friday at Disneyland. Bring your family. Most importantly, bring the team that is going to help you grow a healthy community of love with the tools that you'll be learning. I've had a couple people asking, what if I can't come to the event? The event is to launch a one-year program in training at a deep level, how we can build healthy communities of love, because I think this is at the heart and soul of growing churches. Many of you know I've been a church growth consultant for most of my 25-year career. And when I first started, if you knew me in the 90s, I was all about the perfect program, the perfect worship service. But over the years, I have seen churches that have the worst worship services and the craziest array of programs or no programs at all grow and change their world because of the power of their healthy community of love. And on the other side of that same coin, I've seen churches who have really slick, amazing worship services. And yet there isn't a healthy community of love and their amazing worship service, their cool array of programs, does not successfully grow their church. It can't successfully grow a business. It can't successfully grow a family unless a healthy community of love is at the heart and center of all that we're doing and all that we're offering. And that's my new passion. It's the real core, I believe, in everything I'm teaching about church growth. Any other questions before we sign off for the day? Any other questions about the offer? I'll, uh, Put that detail back on screen in case that you want to see that one more time. Just to remember what you're getting, if you sign up in the next 15 minutes, you'll get that VIP package with the front row seating, the private cocktail hour with me on Tuesday night, um, three free months of my worship training, my worship uh, creativity program called Creative Worship Made Easy, which includes sermon starters every week, words for worship every week, and cool innovative worship planning ideas every week three free coaching or spiritual direction sessions after the event and complimentary copies of my newest book, The Gospel According to Beauty and the Beast. And also my husband and my, our newest book, Is It Communion Sunday Already? And uh, you will also be receiving, if you sign up in the next 15 minutes, two additional coaching sessions this summer as you begin already thinking about how can you create community out of conflict? How can you create healthy community of love right here, right now. I want to help you do that. And I hope that you will be at the event this fall. Um, the cost beyond the conference, the kickoff to the conference is $149 for the event. Denise is asking, what's the cost beyond the conference? The event itself is $149 if you sign up between now and July 23. And that's all inclusive, all three days of the event, including lunch, both Tuesday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday of the event. And like I say, if you stay at the hotel, the hotel is providing for you with your hotel discounted hotel room rate. Again, only 149 a night at the hotel. That includes your breakfast and a pretty hefty happy hour appetizer, which is plenty for dinner if you're a light eater. So that's the three day event. And additional cost beyond the conference, totally optional. There will be two different programs, one and there for your entire church team. One uh, will be at the uh, $4,997 price. That's all automated. It will include 12 months of webinars and um, question and answer uh, through email with me and my team. And then the larger program, which is really for churches that want me live, and that's going to be uh, $14,997, and that will include live coaching and feedback from me so that churches that want to get me individually to work on their specific issues and really train the full team, not just in an automated webinar, but in uh ongoing conversations like this where we won't be just chatting, we'll be talking face-to-face -face or virtually depending on your location. And that price of course is higher. But I'm really looking forward to uh, having people be part of that program. And that program will be offered 
beyond the event if it doesn't sell out at the event. As you can imagine, the higher level program that includes me live will have a limit to the number of people. The automated program will not have a limit, and that will be offered throughout the year of 2019. Both programs will start mid-November and last for a full year and will be fully recorded so that your team will have full access forever to the um, experience uh, and the learning that they've had from that year. Any other questions about the offer or about the upcoming offer? If you're not already on my email list, you'll be added to my email list from having uh, registered for this webinar today. So you can look for emails continuing about the event. Even if you decide not to register today, you may need to talk to your team. There will be other offers, not as good as this one, but other great offers throughout the summer. And you'll be receiving emails with information about those offers. And, uh, uh, and then you can sign up as you are ready to sign up. In addition, you will be receiving offers in the late fall about the automated program as well as the live program if it doesn't sell out at the event. I suspect the live program, because of limited numbers, will sell out at the event. Um, but I'm sure the automated program will have plenty of room for everyone who wants to be a part. Any other questions before we bring our time to a close? I'm scheduled to stay on until 11.15, happy to stay on. Uh, if you have other questions, I'm trying to think if I miss anything, I'm looking at my notes, some questions that came in from email. I think I've addressed those questions. Yeah, I think I've gotten through the questions, but I'm open in case anybody else has another question. Last minute questions, let me know. I'm on for another five minutes here. I'm going to go ahead and stay on, but I'm also going to say thank you to those of you who might be getting ready to log off. I want to thank you for taking time on uh, what I'm sure is a very busy summer morning for those of you who are on the West Coast, a summer afternoon on the East Coast. And thank you for those of you who maybe logged back in today because we had technical difficulties on Friday. Thank you for your patience on Friday. Thank you for joining us today for this a great, a great opportunity to really uh, talk and learn together about how to grow communities out of conflict. I hope you'll share your learnings wide and far. There will be a replay available uh, when this uh, seminar ends, and my son will be editing that replay, and I'll send a link to all of you who've registered for the webinar so that you'll have the fully edited version that you can download for your use with your team completely free of charge. It is so important to me that these tools get out to people so that churches, families, businesses can engage in conflict in constructive ways so that you are able to really find your voice in creating a community of love as opposed to feeling like, oh, this just isn't constructive, this is destructive. I want to help you create it constructively. And creating it constructively begins with the tools you need. So, and it also really only works when the full team have the tools. So I hope you'll share the replay of this webinar and that your team will benefit from these tools. Just one step of many to creating a community of love is to create a community out of conflict. One of the most challenging places to create community and yet there's so much energy around conflict that it gives us a beautiful opportunity to create community that is growing and changing in new and loving ways so i hope this has been helpful i want to thank all of you for joining us today for giving us your valuable time for sharing your insights thank you for those of you who raised questions who let me know when the sound wasn't working so i knew to turn the mute off and I want to wish all of you a blessed and beautiful summer, a community of love to surround and support you and your own leadership as a child of God, that it might be blessed and strengthened by the power of God's Holy Spirit and the love of Christ Jesus that indeed lives in us and calls us forth so that together we each can be helping to create communities of love with each and every step we take in each and every place we go. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions, give me a call or send me an email. Until next we meet again, 
Blessings, my friends.